This week on Adventist News Network, reaching Brazil's largest city with a message of hope. A major study supports the Adventist health message. And we interview youth mentoring advocate and gospel recording artist Whitley Phipps. These stories and more coming up. This is Adventist News Network, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks for joining us this week. We begin this week with a massive outreach project in Brazil. Thousands of Adventists recently gathered in the country's largest city, Sao Paulo, to distribute copies of The Great Hope to residents there. The book is a modern language adaptation of church co-founder Ellen G. White's classic, The Great Controversy. World Church President Ted Wilson joined in the efforts, helping to distribute four million copies of The Great Hope on a recent Sabbath afternoon. Wilson said the book distribution helped get church members out into the community. The book traces God's leading throughout history, and Wilson said it's changing lives. The church in Brazil is planning another outreach event next week called Impact Hope. The event will see thousands of Adventists follow up the distribution by inviting their friends and neighbors to church and lunch in their homes afterward. Adventist leaders in Zambia are saying a recent visit by World Church President Ted Wilson was a welcome reminder of church unity and focus. Wilson met with Adventists in the country while on a recent tour of Africa. Adventist Church President for Zambia, Harrington Akawamba, said the top church leaders visit raise the visibility of Adventists in the country and will positively impact evangelism there. With more than one million members, Zambia has the largest concentration of Adventists in Southern Africa. Wilson met with Adventist young people while in the country and encouraged them to develop a personal relationship with Jesus. I would like to indicate that certainly I will be praying for the people of Zambia in a very special way that they will not only enjoy commercial and daily prosperity, but most of all, that they will learn to love Jesus more and more every day. And that Seventh-day Adventists will be in the forefront of pointing people to Christ and His soon coming. A recent study on the effects of red meat is supporting the Adventist health message. Researchers at Harvard University followed more than 100,000 people over 20 years in a study funded by the National Institutes of Health. They discovered that the amount of red meat a person eats is directly linked to their chances of developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Researchers found that every daily serving of red meat increased the risk of premature death by 12%. Eating processed red meat raised the risk even higher to 20%. Researchers also found that substituting healthier sources of protein, such as fish, nuts, and legumes, significantly reduced mortality rates. This remarkable study demonstrates what Seventh-day Adventists have been promoting for more than a hundred years, that a vegetarian diet, plant-based, reduces the risk of premature death from both heart disease and cancer. Of equal significance, they found that by replacing one serving of red meat per day with vegetarian alternatives reduce the risk between 10 and 19 percent. Adventists in Uganda are raising funds to build a better living center in Kasasi. A recent fundraiser drew government leaders and faith community representatives from the surrounding area. Attendees pledged $70,000 toward the project Church leaders in the region say the centre will positively impact the community. It's expected to house regional church headquarters, a radio station, a restaurant and a fitness centre. Government leaders who attended the fundraiser commended the Adventist Church's focus on education, peace and social development in Uganda. The US Dream Academy is gearing up for its annual Power of a Dream Gala. The Maryland-based Youth Mentorship Organization supports kids who have an incarcerated parent and are falling behind in school. Hundreds of influential political, business, philanthropic, entertainment, and media leaders gather each year for the fundraising gala. 
To date, the annual event has raised $11 million to benefit children in the mentorship program. I sat down with US Dream Academy founder and CEO Whitley Phipps earlier today to find out more about the organization. Whitley is in town this week as the speaker at the Adventist World Church Headquarters Week of Spiritual Emphasis. Whitley, thanks for speaking with us. You're welcome. <laughs> what led you to begin mentoring young people with a parent who's serving a prison sentence? I started singing in prisons about 30 years ago, and I was shaken by what I saw. I did not realize that uh, one of every three young men in America between the ages of 18 and 30 mm -hmm. who looked like me are actually in prison in America mm -hmm. or supervised by the court system of the United States of America. And uh, I found out that about 60% of the kids who end up in prison come from the children of those who are in prison. Mm -hmm. So armed with that information, I couldn't just sit back on the sidelines. I had to get involved and do what I could to help these young people. Wonderful. How is the Academy's mentorship program different than other after-school programs? Uh, the first thing is that uh, we are focused on a very strategic group of young people. Mm -hmm. Most after-school programs take everybody, or they are focused on uh, just mentoring or some recreational kinds of uh, after-school activities. Mm -hmm. Our program, we focus tutoring and mentoring on children who are at the most risk of entering the criminal justice mm -hmm. system, which happens to be children whose parents are incarcerated mm -hmm. and children falling behind in school. Mm -hmm. Well, can you share with us one of the Academy's recent success stories? We've had so many. Uh, uh, we have thousands of kids who come through our program. Uh, but one person comes to mind, uh, a young lady by the name of Adrian. Uh, she uh, is in Washington, D.C., lives in Washington, D.C. And uh, there are about almost 20,000 students in the school system in Washington, D.C. Adrian was a part of our program, and Adrian got a perfect score in math and the only student in all of Washington, D.C. who received a perfect score and the highest score. Wow. And so we're very proud of her. And how do you do that? Uh, by focusing on the best that you have mm -hmm. on kids who are in need. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Oh, you're very welcome. In addition to his work at the U.S. Dream Academy, Whitley is also a world-renowned gospel recording artist, motivational speaker, and Adventist pastor. He has received numerous service awards for his education advocacy. A two-time Grammy Award nominee, Whitley has performed for six U.S. presidents, former South African President Nelson Mandela, humanitarian Mother Teresa, and philanthropist Oprah Winfrey. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So many ways to experience the Bible. The Church's mission quarterly marks 100 years of publication this year. We asked Charlotte Ishkanyan to share some modern-day mission stories and tell us how stories like these helped unite the Church decades ago. Have you heard an exciting mission story this week? Some exciting stories are coming up as we celebrate the centennial of the mission quarterlies and the 13th Sabbath offerings. Learn how John Tay's boyhood dream to visit the island of Pitcairn became a reality and how his experience changed his life and united the young Adventist Church's focus on mission. Be inspired by the story of Cecilia, a young girl who became a literature evangelist at age seven and the surprise God had waiting for her at one business she visited. 
An overcrowded school in Myanmar is making a huge impact on its students and their parents. Learn how we can help this school grow and reach even more children and parents with God's message of love in Myanmar. How many Bibles have, do you have at home? Imagine not having even one. Our children are working this quarter to help buy Bibles for children in one country in Southeast Asia. See the need for yourself and help the children support their own 13th Sabbath project. Don't miss a single mission story this quarter. Visit our website at www.adventistmission.org. Click on Resources and Mission Quarterly and read what God is doing around the world. Now let's turn to Megan Bronner for this week's Adventist social media highlights. This week in social media, we wanted to hear how young adults are becoming vital parts of their churches. On Twitter, May C says more young adults are realizing that the leadership baton is being passed to them. Juan Fresse says technology integration in the church is one area young adults are involved, working with websites, social pages, and AV help. Jamie Renee Chandler says she stays involved with Pathfinders even while she's in college because the youth are so important. Jenna Hyde appreciates having a voice in board meetings and leading out in Adventist youth meetings. Janelle Ramos says she's involved in her church's hospital ministry, while Tarina Jackson serves as an usher. Luke F. says he's blessed with local churches who let him teach and preach on Sabbaths. Alden Kudanin says the young adults at his church have started their own YouTube channel. Chris says he's an AY leader and sings in a quartet, while Laura Leach says the youth in her church are very involved as junior deacons or deaconesses, children's storytellers, and performing in the orchestra and choir. Thank you to all our Twitter friends for their great answers. We're also looking for guests on our social media segment. If you have a social media story to tell, email us at adventistnews at gc.adventist.org for a chance to guest star on this segment. Adventist Religious Liberty Advocates say every church member can be a voice for freedom. Duane Leslie shares a simple way you can stay informed and help raise awareness. As I travel around the world, one of the questions that I often get asked is, what tools are available in the areas of religious liberty? How can I be a voice for freedom? How can I share with my members what's going on in the world? So we've gotten that so often, the Department of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty has put together an electronic newsletter called the Faith and Freedom Report. In this monthly report, you'll be able to get stories of religious persecution or developments in international religious freedom or governmental decisions. With that, we can hopefully use that as a tool to share with your congregation or your community or your government leaders what's going on in the Adventist Church in the areas of religious freedom. If you'd like to take advantage of this free resource, send an email to info at irla.org and this will be hopefully be a great opportunity. Remember, one voice can change the world. Still ahead on Adventist News Network, an interview with the editor of the Journal of Adventist Education. But up next, this week's Tech Corner. I was reading The Great Hope and this phrase caught my attention. Their only safe course was to cherish the light which they had already received of God, hold fast to His promises, and continue to search the scriptures and patiently wait and watch to receive further light. This phrase gives me so much hope because I know that Jesus is coming so soon. I know it seems like it's taking a while, but I just hold on to His promises and I cling fast to them. In Ezekiel 12, the Lord says that He will not prolong His words any longer, but He will do what He says. I have so much faith and I just want to hold on to it and for it not to be shaken because I know the Lord will do what He says. Welcome back. For this week's Tech Corner, John Beckett has a reminder for Adventist technology professionals. Each year, church leaders and lay people interested in using technology for mission gather to share what they've learned and to work on new ideas. 
This year, the conference called GAIN, or GAIN, will meet in May in Hong Kong, China. The unique blend of communicators, technology presenters, and attendees offers a chance to be inspired and learn about the interesting ways technology is being used all over the world to share the good news. Everyone interested in using technology for ministry is welcome to attend. If you want to come to the conference in Hong Kong, you should sign up soon at gain.adventist.org. Other meetings dealing with technology and mission are sometimes planned by church divisions and unions. You can check with your communication director at the division or union office to see if a conference is being planned in your area. You're also welcome to join and contribute to the growing GAIN group on Facebook. This community is a great place to share how you use technology and ask others for ideas. Many church technologists and communicators from all parts of the world are members of this group. The easiest way to find the Facebook group is to visit gain.adventist.org and click on Facebook at the top of the screen. Children's Ministries leaders say it's never too early for children to start thinking of others. Here's Linda Coe with some age-appropriate service project ideas. Involving children in service for others brings great benefits to them. First of all, it helps them develop uh, compassion and also empathy for others. And it helps them to uh, put others' needs ahead of our, their own. Uh, especially uh, we see that in their lives, it helps them develop their Christian growth and maturity. And I also see that another benefit for them, it also helps them to learn some of the life skills, which help them to think of others more than themselves. In today's world, we find that a great emphasis is on you know, self, myself, my own, everything I. But we want our children to learn how to give, and it helps them to develop a uh, life-giving, lifelong giving spirit to be generous, to love others. And you know, today we can get our children involved in many, many activities, uh, such as helping to collect clothing, uh, to help those uh, victims of uh, floods and hurricanes. And at the same time, we can get our children involved in collecting books and uh, used materials that they can contribute to children around the world. At the same time, we want to encourage them to also donate money, their time and talents to pray for someone, to help someone in need. Yes, we want children who care, and we want to raise our children to care for others. And by doing so, they learn to follow the commission of Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. For this week's health feature, doctors Kathleen Kuntaroff and Alan Handysides illustrate how the HIV virus hijacks healthy cells. They'll also explain the medications used to slow that process. Handysides, what are you doing with the toilet paper? Are you planning to write articles on us the doctors in the review? Now, some people think that the, that the articles are hardly worth the paper we write it on. Oh. But if you're doing a, a bus trip across America, this oh. is very valuable paper. No, but that's not what it's all about. What I'm doing, actually, is I'm going to illustrate something. Imagine that this little piece of toilet paper wrapped around this is a virus particle, an HIV virus particle. It gets into a cell called a CD4 cell. Subsets of white blood cells. Yes, and it actually takes over the machinery of the cell and makes the cell make more of itself. It writes itself into the nucleus with a reverse transcriptase enzyme, and then the cell starts producing a whole roll of HIV viruses all bound together, mm -hmm. and they then require another enzyme, like the perforation, mm -hmm. to split them off mm -hmm. as individual virus particles. Those virus particles get themselves wrapped up and go into other cells. Do you know that in two hours, in two hours, a cell can produce a thousand more pieces like this? Now, the medications that are used to control HIV infection are inhibitors of reverse transcriptase and inhibitors of the proteases. Mm -hmm. The medications weren't even heard of in the days of Ellen White. So these couldn't be medications she was saying we shouldn't use. Now let's turn to Lisa Beardsley-Hardy for a look at Adventist education. This week, Lisa interviews Journal of Adventist Education editor Beverly Rumble. Adventist education is not school buildings, it's a philosophy. It's about students and the teachers that teach them. 
That philosophy is best illustrated in the book Education, but there's a journal, the Journal of Adventist Education, that supports teachers in applying that philosophy in a variety of settings. And we have Beverly Rumble, the editor, nearly working for 41 years with this journal to talk with us about it. How many languages does the journal come in? It's in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. And for those that can't get it on paper, is it on the web? It is. There are more than 20 years worth of articles in a searchable database in all four languages, and the website itself is also in four languages. JAE.adventist.org. We'll put that on the screen later. And you have gotten a number of awards and nominations for first place. What for? We've had awards for articles on uh, the philosophy of Adventist education, and for uh, we had one an award for on how to have a butterfly garden at your school, and an award for design for the general conference issue of the journal, among others, for articles and for theme issues. And this journal goes all around the world. It's not yes. just here in the United States. It goes to every continent. What about homeschooling teachers? Can they get this journal? They can order it. Uh, to, they can order a subscription of five copies a year, and they can uh, even use a credit card to pay for the subscription. So any teacher, whether working in a school or outside of the Adventist system or teaching their own children at their home, can ad take advantage of the Journal of Adventist Education. Yes, and we hope also that uh, pastors will uh, be able to read the journal as well as school board members and other people who are interested in Adventist education. Thank you, Beverly, for what you're doing with the Journal of Adventist Education. Thank you, Lisa, for your leadership. When we come back, this week's I Share Report. And later in the program, how literature outreach, like this week's Great Hope distribution in Brazil, got started. There's no other book that I personally know of that anyone would find helpful in guiding them to going back to the Bible than the book Great Controversy. How will a Christian like you, like me, tell this is of the Lord, this is not of the Lord? The Great Controversy will provide an answer to that. Welcome back. Here's Sergio Gonzalez with this week's iShare Report. Welcome to iShare, where you bring us the news. This week, Pastor Jason McCracken sends us a story from Oakwood Adventist University in Huntsville, Alabama. University students recently traveled to Birmingham, Alabama to pass out hundreds of copies of the Adventist Church's Message Magazine to the community. The Literature Evangelism team also enrolled 45 people in Voice of Prophecy correspondence classes. McCracken says the students have been invited back to hold an evangelistic seminar this summer. Thank you, Jason. Have an iShare story to tell? Go to news.avenist.org slash iShare to upload your text and video. Thanks for watching. Church Sabbath School leaders are rolling out new curriculum for children after evaluating a decade of department resources. Gary Swanson has more. Beginning in 2013, it's just a little year, less than a year from now, the Sabbath School and Personal Ministries Department are going to be rolling out some new material for the children's Sabbath school curriculum. We're very excited about this because we've been working on this for two or three years. It's the normal thing to do to uh, assess and evaluate your curriculum after, you've worked, after it's been in use for several years. The children's curriculum has been available now for almost 10, 10 years. And we've been looking at that and we've been subjecting it to uh, focus groups and to surveys, and we found that we'd, we'd like to be able to provide some exciting new things uh, that is going to make the children's Sabbath school curriculum even more exciting than ever before. These kinds of things are going to include some brand new art in a more representational form. We found that there's preference for that. It's going to provide materials that is going to help the teacher and the parent be able to work more effectively and to relate more effectively to their own children and to help them in turn to relate more closely to Jesus. That's what the Sabbath School is all about, is helping our children become closer, ever closer to Jesus. Now let's turn to Benjamin Baker for a look at Adventist history. 
This week, literature evangelism gains traction as a new ministry option. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On March 27, 1847, George Albert King was born. King, a native Canadian, introduced the ministry of the literature evangelism, or call portering, to the Seventh-day Adventist movement. He came about this in a roundabout way when he presented himself to James White as a preacher in need of a pulpit. White and almost everyone else, however, concluded that King had the gift of preaching, not at all. King, indefatigable, set out to find another way to spread the gospel and lit upon the idea of doing it through the sale of Adventist literature, tracts, periodicals, books. Trying it out and discovering it worked quite well. King in turn canvassed the denomination to canvas. The innovation caught on. King, meanwhile, devoted his life to literature evangelism, mostly in New York City, which he plied for two decades until his death in 1906. On March 28, 1955, the Taiwan Adventist Hospital was established in Taipei, Taiwan, through the efforts of Dr. Harry Miller. The medical facility has prospered throughout the years now providing health care to some 25,000 people in the region annually. And that was this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching Adventist News Network. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh day Adventist Church. And as always, you can visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Our good news this week comes from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in the New Testament book of Matthew, chapter 5. It's a passage church leaders in Uganda from earlier in this week's episode are embracing. The passage reads, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Until next week, God bless.